You know, we should start what happened on the weekend with, with the best part rather than maybe the not-so-good part. I mean, the Rays did go 5-2, and two, right? They won three out of four against the Red Sox, mm-hmm. took two out of three against the Toronto Blue Jays. But, man, <laughs> um, Aaron Savali, okay, I've seen enough. I think everybody has seen enough except the opposing lineup. He went his seventh straight start without a win, and during that time, the Rays have lost five of those games. He has an 0-3 record with a 7-7-9 um uh, ERA over that span and he was back at it again he, he allowed five runs four of them were earned five and a third that's the longest outing he's had in more than a month see look Steve, at the positive I, side I mean he's getting it, deeper into games now <laughs> yeah he is and giving up more runs as a result <laughs> um he just he just doesn't have good stuff I mean I've I've tried to I've watched this guy pitch last year and I was, I mean, look, granted, all the injuries they've had to their starting staff has sort of forced their hands with this, right? Um, and they thought they were going to get a better pitcher a year ago, but they certainly bet on that that he would come back and, and be better still. It's just not happening. His stuff is very average. He He's in the middle of the plate way too much. Nobody's fooled by anything, and... He's just given up a bundle of runs, and it's it's hard. You know, they were down five to nothing in this game, and and they were you know banging balls off off the outfield wall. So, um, but that's the that was the only real I mean serious negative to the to the whole road trip. I mean, it's a very good road trip. They had some great wins, of course, in Boston, uh, and then they won their first two games in Toronto. Came from behind, and and won uh, what five to four? Mm-hmm. I guess it was on Saturday. That was a huge win. Uh, for the Rays, they still can't run the bases worth a damn. I mean, they're terrible. You know, there there was one play. I think it was. I think it was Paredes was at second. Balls hit to shortstop, and and granted, it got kicked in the outfield, but only by about a couple feet. But regardless, like he got such a late break to try to go to third that he was out by like ten feet, <laughs> and. You know, you never run to third when a ball hit to short generally because you're going to be an easy out. And even though it got away, um, it didn't get far enough away and you got a late break to boot. And then they get another guy picked off first. And, you know, this has sort of been the Rays' way, you know, on on the basis. They just take themselves out of so many innings. It's been that way for years, though. It's not like this is a new thing. No, it's not a new thing, but it's a frustrating thing. And, and. There's such a, you know, it's it's not a fine line. Like everybody's, what's well, a fine line between aggressive and stupid? No, it's not, really. You know, there's they just run themselves into outs, and, you know, they need all the base runners they can get. So here I am. And defense, Mr. defensively, they've been weak this year, too. They've not been great defensively, no. no. Brady's so made how, another error So how today. the hell do they have a 5 and two road trip <laughs> is what I want to know. And, and Randy Arozarena and Yandy Diaz still not hitting the way They're they should still be. still not hitting, hit, although, although Ray, uh like I guess uh, Yandi was on five straight times on Saturday. He had three yeah, hits true. and, and true. walked mm-hmm. twice. So I mean, he did his job. You know, they couldn't get him out essentially. Um, yeah, but it's you know, look, I I would be if if you're the Tampa Bay Rays, you're thrilled. I think, given this ball club, given the injuries, given the way your your pitchers at times have pitched, um, that you know, that you know, you won four straight games and. Um, you know, what is it? Uh, they had one 11 out of 15. Uh, now they're 25 and 23. So you're two games mm-hmm. over 500. And again, you, you know, you went on this AL East trip, which was, this is going to be huge. Look, Toronto's just can't get out of their own way. You know, they've, they've, they've tried to do it in the past with, uh, uh, you know, some of the big bats and, and they've added to that. Now, now they're kind of letting some of their, you know, they, I mean, they still got, you know, the Guerreros and people like that. But now they're letting some of their their farm system come up behind him, and it's just it's just not happening for them right now. So I don't I don't know that Toronto is going to get back in this thing. I mean, it's still we're still in the middle of May or towards the mm-hmm. end of May, but um, but these were big wins. You know, they they needed to you know to take down some AL East teams, and they're playing much better. Yep. They're well, not only that, but they're in a stretch of 13 straight games, too. Yeah. No days off. Now, they're going to yeah. get a ton of days off after this Boston series. True, true. I think it's like four days in the next two weeks, essentially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
which which will help, especially with the bullpen in that. But so far, what, 6-4 and four in this 10-game stretch with three against Boston left? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they got they got to keep the pressure on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, going back going back to Savali, though, you know, like, when they got him at the deadline in Cleveland, he had pitched really well there. I mean, so they, they thought they were getting a guy that was 5-2 and two with a 2-3-4 ERA. Mm-hmm. Um, then he went 2-3, and three and he was 5-3-6 last year in 10 starts. And they still felt like he pitched better than his numbers would indicate. But it's just, you know. When the season started, I, I guess I mean he got two wins quickly. His first three starts were good. Yeah, two and one, two twelve. That's that's mm-hmm. fantastic. Um, but well, let, me get, let me drop this stat on you from Ryan Bass. Yeah, since April twenty first, Savali has the worst ERA of any starter in Major League Baseball at eight eight seven. Ouch, babe. That is not good. No, you don't want to be last in anything. You don't want to be worst in anything. You know. He says and that's, stuff that's is not good. a small sample size. That's a month. Yeah. No, I know. I know. It ain't happening. But Jeffrey Springs is on his way back. And, you know, the Ryan, bullpen. Ryan Pepio is going to be back. That's Pepio's be coming big. back. He took the line drive off, off the uh, the calf muscle mm-hmm. there. and Which, um, he, and, and, and hold on, we didn't even talk about this Friday night. Because Mark Topkin brings up that Tyler Alexander may get sent down. The man almost threw a perfecto, starts. dude. 22 yeah. straight outs. I know. <laughs> now, I was lucky to win the game because they, they rallied. but It uh, fell apart quick on them. But you after, know what's interesting you know. about that? The, the funniest thing I thought about that whole thing was, so Alexander goes back out there and it's what, two outs in the eighth, I think, before he gives up a hit? Uh, it was one out in the eighth. It was seven one and out a third in the innings. He went okay, back. seven and third. So one out in the eighth. So he goes back out there and, you know, he'd been pretty efficient in terms of pitches. I, I don't know if he had enough to get through the night. It all depended but because you don't want to say anything, everybody knows the deal. He's got a perfecto. Um, certainly, he knows it. No one's talking to him in the dugout. But Cash didn't get anybody up in the bullpen because they don't like, want to. They don't because you, you don't want to want signal to the guy that we don't have faith this is going to happen. You don't want to change anything. Yeah, but just but, just just four years ago in the postseason, they got someone up when Blake was dealing, and that's what threw <laughs> Blake know. off. That was just a World <laughs> Series game. What the hell? Um, but you know. It, it it's one of those sort of unwritten written rules. I don't know whatever it is in baseball. You know, kind of like don't talk to the pitcher when he has a no header, much less a perfect game. And and so no one's in the bullpen. Well, guess what? When he got into trouble, <laughs> it escalated quickly. I mean, they couldn't get somebody in there fast enough because nobody was loose. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, so that that became problematic. And so they were sort of fortunate to hang on. To win that game, despite how well he pitched, and now so his reward is to go back down to Durham. Is that right? Well, I mean, what Mark is speculating, and, and we don't know what the Rays will do. But when Pepio comes back this week, yeah, they could either move Tyler to a long bulk guy, and, you know, long relief guy, or yeah. they could send him down to Durham to keep him uh, stretched on out. A starters rotation stretched out, and and Durham doesn't have a lot of pitching depth anyway from starters, so it might help yeah. him there. Yeah, uh, they could instead send down someone else to make room for Pepio, and like you said, leave Tyler as a long guy. But yeah, you know, they might. It, odds are they'd probably send him down to keep stretched out. I mean, they're going to get some guys back, and and one of those guys, and Mark Tompkin wrote about this too. Mm-hmm. Brandon Lau might be headed back this way, and that that presents some interesting dilemmas with respect to, you know. If you play him at second base, you know, they've, they've been kind of putting a lot of guys into that spot. You know, does somebody have to go down? Well, they're going to have to move somebody to activate them. So, true. you know, Mark speculated a few things. He said you could DFA Harold Ramirez, but that's mm. a big salary to eat. He hasn't been as good. Yeah, Ramirez has not been playing this year. Yeah, he's, I mean, you know, he's just a DH only. Um, you right. could send down Aranda. You could send down Palacios or DeLuca, who and going into the season you kind of thought would be on the, the Durham shuttle. Back but I forth. think DeLuca but, has had some big moments and driven mm-hmm. on some big runs. He had the, the go-ahead two-run homer the other night mm-hmm. uh, or afternoon in Toronto to give mm-hmm. them the 5-4 to four lead. And Palacios has been great, too. So do you really want to send I don't want to lose Palacios. And he's a left-handed bat. I know Blau is, too, but mm-hmm. I, I'd rather have more than fewer. 
Yeah, it's it's an interesting dilemma. It, it's but, gonna, I mean, a lot of times these things work themselves out. Although Brendan Lau could be back today, so yeah, that's true. Um, you know, they'll have to make a decision at that point. Yeah. Well, getting players back is a good thing, but um, it, it does mean that some of the guys that have helped them to this point might might not be here for long or might have to go down to Durham. We'll see. But overall, I mean, look, um, they've righted the ship. They've they've gotten themselves back in pretty good shape in the AL East. Uh, the Yankees, unfortunately for them, are still rolling. And, you know, they still have a couple teams ahead of them. But, you know, you just want to. The Rays are currently, look, they're tied for the last wild card. Yeah, they're back in it. Yeah. Like no a question. week ago, we were talking about, you know, geez, they got four teams. It was like to four jump. teams in between them. Yeah. yeah. They're now tied with the Twins for the final wild card spot. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's how well they played. Mm-hmm. So give them their flowers, man. They've they've done a nice job of getting back into it, but still got some some question marks ahead and um you know, but they, but they absolutely needed a good road trip, especially against the L East and, and they got it. So we'll now see they what they come do. come home and beat Boston. Yes. Yes. And Boston, you know, it's interesting. Their pitching is really really good. They don't score a ton of runs though. You know, it's a team. It's a team that re- resembles the Rays in so many ways, where you got one or two, you know, big superstars on there that can bash, and then the rest of them are just kind of trying to, you know, manufacture runs. So uh, those were all close games. You know, in Boston, they were all games that, mm-hmm. you know, you felt like uh, the Rays pitching was sort of dominant throughout that whole series. But uh, they need to keep that going, and they need to, need to establish, you know, winning at home being being good at the trop like they were uh, a year ago. That's that's always the key. They picked up another left-handed reliever uh, from the Cubs, Richard Lovelady. Don't know much about him. Uh, not impressive numbers, but again, a left-handed arm out of the bullpen. So uh, that's important to him. So yeah, we'll see. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there were some interesting uh, doings at the PGA uh, tournament over the weekend, and I guess we'd have to start with Friday because we didn't have a chance to chat that day, Steve. Um, you know, I, I think I said that I would take Scotty Scheffler over the field. Was that to what get I arrested or win the tournament? What, what, yeah, what, I, what I didn't bet on was there was a lockup involved here. It's kind of hard to win the tournament, uh, you know, from a holding cell. And, and uh, the whole thing was, was bizarre, and it happened early, early in the morning. And unfortunately, there was an accident where someone lost their life, uh, someone who was actually working the tournament, I believe at Valhalla at the time and, and was hit, hit, uh, by a vehicle. Uh, and so there were a lot of emergency vehicles out there and some confusion because, um, they were letting the golfers through this area because they knew they had to get to the club for their tee times, et cetera. And for whatever reason, uh, Scheffler, uh, didn't yield or didn't stop when he was asked to by what he, you know, was, was a police officer. Um, a lot of times, you know, there's security and or off-duty police, whatever, that will kind of monitor that situation and let the players through. But the really bizarre thing was my friend Jeff Darlington, who's, of course, you know, from ESPN, and uh, grew up mm-hmm. in Seminole and all that. Uh, he just happened to be behind Scheffler, so about 100 feet. So he got out of his car and he started filming this thing. And it was bizarre because at one point Scheffler turns around and goes, help me <laughs> to Jeff. Like, what do you want me to do? And, you know, I think he just don't tell him who I am, but, but Scotty didn't use that card or, or maybe they would have, uh, would have felt differently about handcuffing him. Uh, and then of course it was, you know, they told Darlington to back off, which of course he did. The whole thing was bizarre. Uh, they did turn around you know, his processing though, and he had the orange jumpsuit and the whole deal and all the, all the bad jokes were out there. Um, but dang it, he made it to his tea time at like what, 10 after 10 or something like that. And yeah, everything was pushed back like an hour, 20 minutes because of what happened that morning. Yeah. Which, which yeah, helped but him they, make his tea time. Yeah. But, he, but they helped him make it and, and he did, and he played well. I think he shot like a 66, mm-hmm. you know? No, so, he did very well. I mean, he did well yeah. for the tournament. Right. Right. But what a bizarre sort of, you know, and now he's charged with a whole bunch of things, including a felony. Um, and most of them are misdemeanors. We'll see if that sticks or if some, the DA drops that that charge. And, and it's basically because, according to police, uh, he, he dragged one of the officers who suffered 
some injuries to his elbow and his knee and, you know, ripped his pants and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it could have been serious and, and, uh, you certainly need to follow, you know, follow orders, but there definitely was some miscommunication on, on, uh, on Scheffler's part and we'll see how it all turns out, but it was bizarre sort of subplot to the whole, you know, the whole tournament, you know, especially that day. And yet, uh, you know, congratulations to Xander Shoffley wins his first major. He's been at it a while and he's finished, you know, in, in the top three, top five, several times. But how about this? How about shooting 21 under par, which is a major uh, record or a record in the majors for the most most shots under par? Uh, and Bryson DeChambeau was 20 under and lost. Can you That's only been that? done like five other times in major championship history to shoot 20 under. Yeah, 20 under, yeah. yeah. Although, could you put an asterisk by this? Why? Because the lowest combined score to par by the field in PGA Championship history, the previous low total was in 1995 at Riviera. The field went plus 40 to par. Add up all mm-hmm. the scores. Mm-hmm. 2024 Valhalla, the combined field score, minus 214. <laughs> 254 stroke better or the golfers were better than any other PGA championship history. The only time ever you've had a negative field score. Wow. Yeah. I think maybe Valhalla might be due for uh, some renovation and some longer holes perhaps because some of these guys were driving to greens, you know? Yeah. Yeah, It wasn't, the, uh, it, PGA championships are not supposed to be easy. They're supposed to be hard. In fact, they're supposed to be yeah. harder. And but well, I more Ka- more Kawa's finished what nineteen under and was third. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was, it was, the scores were insane. I mean, these guys, you know, literally have not played or had a lower score in their careers in some instances, and they still lost. But I'll say this though: like when you looked at the leaderboard, there was no slackies there. Like there, it was it was all. All the top golfers in the world made it to the top of that leaderboard, so the cream rose, but a little too fast. And uh, but even you know it was it was drama, if oh, you it will. Was. It was good. I, I mean, I'll correct to, myself too. It was Hovland finished at eighteen under and third. Hovland was eighteen under. Yeah, yeah Morikawa so, was fifteen under. But but they they you know they go to eighteen and Shoffley has to make birdie and his drive is almost into the bunker, but not quite, which was worse in some ways because then. He had to have a stance, and the ball was, you know, well above his feet, and he was in the sand trap when he hit it, kind of taking a baseball swing, but he got up there close enough to the green uh, to get up and down, and, you know, he was able to birdie this thing, and even his putt, which was a little over six feet, rimmed in, you know? Mm -hmm. There was drama with that, so really, it's always, you know, I think it's always cool to see a guy win his first major, especially somebody that's been as good a golfer as him. And uh, I, you could tell there were a lot of other, you know, PGA professionals there that were very happy for him. So no matter, you know, 21 under is what it took to win the damn thing. And he led. The other thing was, I think this has only happened about a dozen or so times where he went wire to wire in a major. You know, he he, mm-hmm. he led the first day. And so, you know, got to give him credit for that, too. So it was, it was a, you know, interesting tournament. But, yeah, you might want to just toughen up. You know, maybe maybe Tiger proof that thing. Tiger, by the way, didn't make the cut. He was, I think, plus one the first day, ended up plus seven. So he missed the cut. It's just going to be harder and harder for him because he doesn't play enough, you know, and the injuries are limiting him. The next time we'll see him, I guess, would be what? The British Open would be uh, yeah, probably the next. That should be in major. June, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that, that's difficult. Um. Or no, it won't be uh, the U.S. Opens in June. It'll be U.S. Open. Oh, U.S. Open. That's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. British Open. US will be Open. July. Then, then yeah. yeah. Then the July will be British Open, right? Yeah. So the U.S. Open will be the next one we see. Yep. Uh, but again, I think it's it's really hard for him to maintain any kind of level of competitiveness, and physically, it's it's hard for him to get around as well. But uh, but yeah, watch a little golf. Uh, let's see. Uh, had an anniversary. That was fun. Um, what else, what else? went on we had oh, wait, you had an anniversary yeah yeah the wife and i you know so, so. so your birthday and anniversary in the same week well yeah it's confusing but uh i 
you know, you, you kind of celebrate them mm-hmm. individually and yet collectively. Yeah, I know. May is a big month, man. We got a lot of birthdays in May in our family too. Like there's a lot of, uh, on Val's side, a lot of people have birthdays in May. Huh? So May, May is uh May day, <laughs> uh, <laughs> as you would, you know, uh, as the call goes out, but yeah. Um, so had a lot, had a lot to celebrate, ate a lot of cake. It seems blew out a, a few candles and, and, you know, on we go. So, uh, there was one, there's a couple of other things I wanted to mention, uh, today, we're going to have a chance to uh, talk to and I guess celebrate, if you will, um, the signing of Antoine Winfield Jr. to that enormous contract. He is the highest paid defensive uh, defensive back in the NFL in NFL history. Uh, what some eighty four million dollars, I think, five years, and he called his shot. You know, a year ago when he during an off season workout, and he's posted that on Instagram. Want to ask him about that? He'll be available to us. I want to say around two o'clock. So, if you're celebrating uh, that, will there be cake there too? Well, I could bring in mine because I have so much <laughs> cake left over. Like it was ridiculous. Like who's eating all this cake? You know, I mean, I could eat it, but then I'd have to waddle into the facility. So, I probably should bring them birthday cake and let them celebrate with that. Um, but I'm sure he can buy all the cake he needs to. <laughs> he got a lot of got a lot of cake too. Uh, Eighty four million dollars worth. So. He's good, as they say. And then OTAs are going to begin the, uh, you know, organized uh, team activities, as they call them, Mm -hmm. which is interesting because they're really just practices. But then you also have the option, if you want, to take them to a movie or go rock climbing or whatever team building thing you want to have. But you only get so many of them. And they have three a week now for the next three weeks. We get to at least have access to players on one of those three. So I believe that day will be Tuesday okay. of this week. Um, and so we'll have a chance to talk to some players. I don't know, maybe even Baker Mayfield. I, I really don't know. Look, the next guy up um, is going to be Tristan Wirfs. Mm-hmm. And I think that deal will be done probably around training camp. I really don't know because I'm, I've not gotten any – there's not been a whole lot about uh, Tristan's negotiations of yet. And he is under the fifth-year contract. You know, it's not a situation where – you know, with Antoine Winfield Jr., uh, you know, he he essentially was franchised and you'd have to play under the franchise tender if they hadn't re-signed him or extended him by July. Tristan has a deal for like some $18 million for this year, um, but obviously he's worth more than that and he wants the long-term deal and they're going to give it to him now, I believe. But that deal, if you think, you know, Winfield set the market, guess what? So will this. Uh, the moving the left tackle was a, a big financial uh, plus for, for Tristan Wirfs. And, you know, Penny Sewell signed a huge deal that's worth about $27 million, I want to say, a year. Tristan's going to set the market. He's going to be the highest paid offensive lineman in NFL history. It's just his turn, and that's how things go. So I would I would imagine the average yearly salary will be around $28 million or so. Um, and he deserves it, you know, because he's done, he's made three straight pro bowls. Um, you know, he had a lot of anxiety about making this move from right to left tackle. Didn't see really any slippage, you know, uh, did, did give up five sacks and, and had a few penalties, but overall, when you're going against, you know, the best edge rushers in the league coming off that blind side of the quarterback, then, you know, he more than held his own. And, and like I said, if he plays eight years or so, I think he's going to put on a gold jacket, you know, along with Antoine Winfield Jr. That's just how good he is. And you feel good about the guy because he's a really good guy. He's a first-year captain this year. You know, his story is is uh, uh, is u- interesting. It's unique. Growing up in Iowa, um, you know, his mom had him and his sister, uh, single parent. Uh, she began working uh, at Target when she was like 18, 19 years old and progressed all the way up. Uh, you know, to management out there. And of course, now she doesn't have to work. And, you know, Tristan and his sister, he's taking care of her. I think, believe she went to medical school and he's paid for that. So it's really a neat family story and just, you know, of course, a great player and somebody that has become a, a real leader for them. And those are the guys, you know, you think about the contracts now that the Glazers have laid out this year. And, Obviously, they get a ton of TV money, and and you know the salary cap is what it is based on revenues. 
Um, but when you sign players to big deals that have large signing bonuses, you got to go into your bank account and get that cash out, you know, and that, and they've done it. I mean, they've did it obviously with Mike Evans uh, and, you know, he got like 20 and a half million a year, did it with Baker Mayfield, which is on the books for three years and a hundred million. Um, did it with Antoine Winfield Jr. Obviously Levante David got a one year deal. And, and now I think Tristan is up for one. So uh, when you look at the guaranteed money in those contracts, when you look at the signing bonuses, that's cash. You know, and so they're willing to spend to keep their core players, and they've got a bunch of a bunch of young ones, you know, that uh, have come in here, been drafted, they develop them, and those are the guys you want to reward going forward. That's how you build Super Bowl teams, right? You draft, develop, and then you fill in around them in free agency. So, you know, stability with those players, and then also just really good players, you know, and um. And then and your quarterback position being the most in terms of continuity. You got continuity in front office, continuity in coaching. So we'll see. You know, I know everybody's still picking the Atlanta Falcons, and we saw the schedules the other day. And the Bucks schedule is very, very difficult, no question about that. Um, but the Bucks are sort of wearing that chip on their shoulder again because, you know, even despite them winning three straight division titles, everybody, everybody's favorite team is the Atlanta Falcons. And I think they're going to be really, really good with Kirk Cousins or, you know, whoever ultimately ends up quarterbacking them. Um, But you've got to go through Tampa to win that division, and and that's sort of the way it's been for the last three years. One more note for the Bucs. Graham Barton, the first-round draft pick for the Buccaneers, throwing out the first pitch at the Rays game tonight. And they're playing the Red Sox, right? That is correct. Okay. So Graham, the Duke kid, Now, my recommendation would be this, and I don't know that he'll do it, but it almost feels like he needs to. Um, He's a big athletic guy. He played lacrosse. It's not going to be hard for him to throw a baseball, uh, you know, 60 feet, six inches. Mm -hmm. Of course, you should never stand on the mound if you don't do it. That's not a great idea. But for Graham Barton, coming in here as the first-round pick of the Bucs, he's a center. Mm -hmm. Okay? He's going to play center. He's already started to play center. I think he should – face away from the plate and snap put his it. head towards center field, bend over and snap the baseball between his legs. That's what I want to see. I remember was it 12, 13, 14 years ago, Guy Boucher did the first pitch at Tropicana field and they put the, the ball right on the pitching rubber and he took a hockey stick and hit the, the baseball and it was right down the middle. It was I loved it. I absolutely, I thought that was the greatest first pitch I've seen in Tropicana. I really did. I mm-hmm. thought that was perfect. You know, I've seen some bad ones too. Oh, oh man, yes. I've seen some bad ones. I still, the one, you got to go back and look, but the one that Greg Schiano airmails it on the fly to yeah, the middle of bad. the backstop, oh my God, did he hump up on that thing, you know? Toes Easy. on the line. E- e- toe, toes on the line, ball over our head. You missed the. I, I don't even know who was catching. Might have been the mascot. If we'd have just but, watched his uh, film at Rutgers, we'd have known that's what he'd done. <laughs> we would have known exactly. He almost hit the Durham Bull back there, man. Um, <laughs> get a it free was, steak uh, for that or whatever. He <laughs> get free steak, yeah, something like that. The mascot, but yeah, um, there's been some. There's been some interesting, uh, interesting ones. Philip Bailey threw out the first pitch one time. That 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 worked out okay. Um, but yeah, so Graham Barton, who's a heck of a nice kid, give him a big hand because he's he's going to be. And I wrote about this in the Tampa Bay Times and on Tampa Bay You know, he's a, he's one maybe the the biggest piece of this whole. I don't want to put the season on him, but if you just looked at the Bucks and you said, you know, who's who should or could have the biggest impact? Look, they can't run the football, and Liam Cohen I think is going to help with that because he's going to give them opportunity to get into the right plays against the right fronts. And so coaching matters. But the offensive line has been the issue, particularly the interior offensive line. And if Graham Barton does what I think he's going to do, he's going to keep Baker Mayfield's feet clean. He's going to absolutely move some people in front of him. And and they're going to solidify that offensive line. And I think that's that's just going to be the whole key to everything is being able to run the ball when you need to run it, protect Baker Mayfield when you need to protect him, keep him in the pocket, don't get him hit as much as he did last year. And he's got to be smart about not getting taking hits unnecessarily as well. But Barton is, you know, looks the part, sounds the part, and I think he's going to be the part. I think he's going to be a huge upgrade over Robert Haynes. He's not as experienced, but a really bright guy, a quick study. 
they've got to settle on what they're going to do, you know, at guard next to him. But uh, the rest of the offensive line is pretty well set. So, yeah, check out. And, he, and in the mini camp, what I wrote about is this guy came in day one. And, of course, all eyes are on the first round picks on all the draft picks, actually. Um, but they had their mini camp uh, a few weeks ago. And it was Barton, uh, of course, who had to make the line checks and the calls. And so you're you're already sort of in this, you know, vocal mode to some degree. But he did more than that. He was the guy that brought the team up before practice and broke them down after practice. And I thought, you know what, that's pretty assertive for a center. Um, but that's he understands, you know, his role. He understands his position on uh, on the on the offensive line. And also, you know, among those rookies, these were all rookies. This was not, and I'm not saying they're going to do that necessarily during the regular season. I don't, I'm not predicting he's going to wear a captain C uh, like Tristan Wirfs did. But uh, I do think. Uh, he thought it was important to establish himself as sort of a voice, you know, in the huddle and, and outside the huddle as well in, in the big scrum when they bring everybody together. So that was pretty interesting. All right. So when I go out there this afternoon, just check it out um, on our uh, website, tampa.com. We'll have our comments from Anton Winfield Jr., his press conference at 2 o'clock. And then it's the Rays hosting the Red Sox this time at Tropicana Field as they continue uh, sort of this uh, good streak of good baseball. And hopefully that that will continue uh, tonight for them. And um, yeah, I, I think they've they've done a nice job of sort of riding the ship, turning it around, and seeing if they continue to have a, a really good May here. So another AL East opponent, same one they just took three out of four in Boston, should be a great series. We appreciate you guys listening. Of course, every Monday through Friday, for Steve Burstick, I'm Rick Stroud of the Tempe Times. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>